Merhabalar. Ben aslında bir yabancıyım. Esra'nın dedi gibi. 15 senedir buradayım ve yine bir gün Türkçe aslında konuşmayacağım. Yani konuşabilirim. Aslında böyle bir yabancı değilim. Fakat yani 18'de her şeyi toparlamak için yani izninizle yani ben İngilizce sunum yapacağım size. Most of us have heard of Winston Churchill. We all know of him as a great leader, as a great statesman. He also said a great number of wonderful things. A lot of quotations have been put out into the world from Winston Churchill. One of the ones that impacted me the most in my professional life has been his phrase that first we shape our buildings and then they shape us. And this was actually said after the Second World War when many of the cities of uh, Europe needed to be rebuilt and very, very quickly. And he had the foresight to understand that that type of quick building, in fact, would shape our behavior and the way we actually perceive the world. And is, uh, Istanbul is going through such an intense period of growth right now, as are many of the other cities in the world. It's actually a very, very useful tool for us to actually realize that we do have a relationship with buildings. And in fact, we shouldn't just let things happen as they are. We need to understand what is that relationship and how we can impact that. And I think it's one of the most important things on the agenda of our lives today in Istanbul. To tell you a bit about myself and how buildings have shaped me, this is my home. Uh, this is a small island in Canada in the middle of pretty well nowhere. In fact, there's only about 500 people that live in this area. And there's an old joke that goes, the population's been 500, why? Because every time a child is born, a guy leaves town and he never comes back. <laughs> I don't think that's actually true. It's funny, but it's not necessarily true. It's a place that is uh, very self-sustaining. It operates with the seasons. It's a part of the world that actually has winters of minus 30 degrees. Summertime, it goes to plus 30 degrees and pretty well everything in between. But what we do there, it's our summer house. It's not our formal house, but I've spent most of my summers there since I was a kid. And we tend to go back as often as we can during the summers with uh, our friends and uh, to you know, merge together with our family and with, with uh, our friendship. There's no connection to the city grid. There's no electricity. Your cell phones don't actually work, which is actually really hard to deal with for a couple of days, but you do get used to it. And it's a wonderful feeling, actually, once you get through that. Uh, we drink from the lake, we use the lake water, we cut wood, we burn wood, uh, we have solar energy, we have wind energy that we use. And it's a place that we actually really feel um, the balance of nature. And of course, fishing at five o'clock in the morning, you can start to feel not only how nature is breathing, but how you yourself actually are breathing at that time. And it's really a wonderful feeling. And it's something we've really separated from in our urban lives. We don't often think about these things. We don't have time to think about these things. So it really is a kind of turbocharged reconnection for us to be at a moment like that. And you also have to really understand nature. As you can see in this image, nature can actually uh, change very, very quickly. Within five minutes, you can go from a sunset through to a lightning storm to a, a hurricane, nearly. And uh, we're seeing more and more of that, of course. So climate change is another thing that you really feel when you're in the middle of nature by yourself. For my son, who's somewhere here somewhere, I hope, uh, it's a chance for us to reorient our relationship with technology as well. So less iPad and a bit more interaction with real living things. And no, even he doesn't touch them with his own hands yet. That's next summer's challenge. Uh, it's really an important uh, lesson that, again, we don't have enough of in our city lives. We also, as I said, come together with friends of ours from around the world, all of whom are like us in very stressful jobs, you know, phones going off all the time. The phones don't work, so what do we do? We build things together. You can see a few examples of our project this summer. Uh, we hauled about, uh, I don't know how many tons of gravel out of the lake and actually built a, a kind of uh, a patio, which my mother was very, very happy about. Uh, so we actually reorient, you know, reorient our friendship in a way where we come together to not only talk and enjoy one another's company, but really build things together. And it's our chance to really kind of come together to regroup, to be connected with nature and to really enjoy our friendships and to get personal with one another. And this lesson is actually something that uh, many of you that might have a boat know a little bit about, actually. If you've ever been on a boat holiday for more than a week with the wrong people, you probably know what I'm talking about. It can be an absolute disaster. So when you're on your own island, of course, you choose your friends. If you're on your boat, you choose your friends, and that gives you a depth to that relationship, which is really, really very, very critical. Secondly, because what goes on an island or what goes on a boat must go off it, and it's hard work to carry all these things, you can really actually separate your needs and, you want, and your wants very, very easily. And these are really valuable lessons for us to live more sustainable in cities as well. Thirdly, if we think 
you know, you're in the middle of nowhere, you need to know how act things actually work. You can't just call a number and somebody will come and fix your stove for you. You need, how to, you need to know how to do these things yourself. Uh, so that's also a very, very important life lesson. And lastly, there's nothing quite uh, like living together with your own garbage for a week at a time to understand how much you actually consume and how much we waste. These are lessons that we don't actually sense in the cities. We just throw our garbage outside, somebody takes it, somebody does something with it, and we have no idea where it goes. That's not the right way to live. So there's actually a game that you can use, something to help you educate yourself a little bit more about this. Just imagine that you live on a boat. Imagine that you live on your own island. And the choices you start making in terms of what you actually need versus what you actually want, who your real friends are, and how you actually want to and should live is a, is a lesson that is very useful for everybody. But, you know, here I am standing talking to you today. I'm in a city. I've been living in a city for pretty well half of my life. And I'm caught in the same type of lure of the city that all of us are caught in. But I'd like to say it's not necessarily a lure. It's actually a trap. And we need to be aware of that. If we look at how Istanbul has changed over the course of, and actually this lure that I wanted to tell you about is something that is really impacting all of the world's populations. Uh, right, right now, 53% of people in the world live in cities, and that number is expected to increase to about 70% by the year 2050. So it's a time frame within our own life, within our own life scale. In Istanbul, when I first moved here 15 years ago, this was a city that had maybe one or two shopping centers, no more. There were a few more on the way, but it was a, you know, moderate. You know, there weren't enough, in fact. There were only a few four or five star hotels. There were only a few high-rise buildings. But if we look at where we are today, within the scope of a very, very small period of time, we've got literally hundreds of shopping centers. We've got hundreds of hotels. Uh, we have cranes all over the city. All of us know that, but you know, we sense that uh, we're missing something here. We're missing the good old days of the way Istanbul used to feel like a manageable city. And in the year 1999, the population, when I moved here, was only about 9 million. Now, it's, of course, somewhere well beyond that. We don't even know where the number is. Is it 15? Is it 18? Nobody can really count that high anymore. How many shopping centers do we have? We don't even really know anymore what actually qualifies. And this is a very important realization for us. In addition to the people that are actually living in these cities, we have more and more people visiting Istanbul. Uh, when I first moved here, there were roughly 500,000 tourists, and I said to myself, you know, this is such a great place, why aren't more people coming? Lo and behold, these days, we've got more than 10 million people coming to Istanbul that are somehow using the city together with all of the people that are already living here. So, depending on how you do the math, I think it's fair to say that we've got at least 20 million people using this city at peak times during the summer months when a lot of tourists are coming through. The city never sleeps. It's a 24-7 city, like many of the world's cities. But really, it's also the complete opposite of living on your own island or on your own boat. And what does that do to people? It makes them mad. It makes them stressful. We all feel it in this room. Maybe we're not going quite that far, but before it goes that far, we have to make some adjustments to our lives. Some recent statistics that were published by the OECD comparing Turkey's situation with other countries in the developed world. You can see the results here. In terms of life satisfaction, the only people in the world that were actually more unhappy than the Turks were the Greeks, and we all know what they've gone through these days. In terms of actually having any sense of life-work balance, absolutely nobody thinks that they have a balance between their work life and their actual lives themselves. In terms of community, Turkey is failing, uh, faring a little bit better on this, primarily as a result of what's happened in the post-Gezi period of people coming together to actually think a little bit more about what it means to be part of a community. We also see that people are a little bit more aware of the trap of life. You know, prices are going up, petrol prices are rising, real estate prices are constantly rising, meat prices are rising, the price of fuel is rising. But people's salaries are pretty well the same. They don't really change. So this is creating some additional pressures on people. This reminds me of the situation in Paris or Rome or other cities that over the past 20 years have really been overrun by tourism and their cities have really been taken completely over. If most of us have been to a French restaurant, I'm sure, where the waiter has looked down at you know, our, our, or our efforts to speak a bit of French to order and you know, there's this kind of surliness about the whole thing. And I thought for a while maybe that's just what it means to be French, but in reality, it's probably not that. These people have been overwhelmed. They don't actually feel any connect connection to their cities anymore. And before that actually starts to happen in Istanbul, we need to realize that we're at a tipping point, that there's still something we can do to maybe change the way we're living or to change the way that we're thinking about our lives uh, to avoid that actually starting to happen here. And that's what I do actually for a living. I worry about these things. I try to fix these things. Uh, as a developer, um, 
at least a developer that is trying to do the right thing. Uh, the world that I see around me exists in the world that we have in our brain, which is, of course, often split between right-side brain thinking, which is more creative, where the original ideas are actually coming from, and the logical or left side of the brain, which is effectively money and, uh, and more analytical and system-oriented. And if we look at a mind map of what actually that means in the building industry, we have many, many different professions and activities coming together to ultimately create a project which starts from an idea and actually is built. And my job as a developer is not to do necessarily all of these jobs, but to actually see that all of these parts are really important in the process and to somehow connect the dots between the two to make sure that the voice of every part of the project is heard, process is heard rather. So it's kind of like being a bridge between both sides of the brain. And it's a, it's a line that you walk between the left and right side way of thinking to ensure that things uh, happen the way they should, that the issues of money and of client and of budgets don't actually drive our world uh, simply by mathematical means or by process-oriented means. Buildings are very important because our life is in buildings. We work in buildings, we sleep in buildings, we eat in buildings, we meet our friends in buildings. We're in a building right now. So our lives are buildings, and it's important that they take a shape which is not just monetary or technical. So it's my role in life, I think, to actually try to make the, the voice of the softer side also heard. And one of the things that scares me to death is that many of the buildings that have recently been completed in Istanbul, just a few years back, are now in need of repositioning. You know, we, we're fixing something that is broken even before it really started taking off. And we're seeing more and more of that starting to happen. And um, there's a huge responsibility to actually think very, very deeply about that. What are we doing with these buildings? If we think of animals living like this, and if you actually think about it a bit, it's not so far from the way most of the people in large cities are actually living as well. And what's happening to them? They start pecking at each other. They're getting angry with each other. So the buildings around us have actually started to shape us, and they're shaping us in a way that is actually making us much more aggressive and pushing us away from our actual core humanity. And part of this reason, like I just mentioned, is in fact because we don't think of buildings as places that actually are really soulful for us or really important for us or as a launch pad for our hopes and dreams, we tend to think them about, about them in ways that are very mathematical. Does it have one bedroom? Does it have two bedrooms? Is it X number of square meters? How much does it cost? These are the only types of things that most people think about when they actually think about buildings. In the world that we work in, we have a, a template system for how to make a sustainable building, which is what we call the 3E system. And what this is, in fact, is a kind of um, a matrix of factors that go into pushing a, pulling a project together. Partly they're economical. How much does it cost? Does it make a good investment return? People in Turkey are especially good at this. I mean, there aren't too many investments that aren't uh, put through a very strict process of understanding if it actually works or not. Uh, ecologically, is the building reducing our carbon footprint? Is it actually uh, minimizing its impact on, on the world, on the environment? More and more, even though it's far behind and we, well too late, that's starting to happen, uh, which is encouraging. But the most important part, I believe, of this whole process is what is our relationship to these buildings and what is our relationship to each other? And do buildings actually help us come together more and celebrate our humanity or do they distance us from it? And that is the, the point of what I'm trying to talk about today. But to actually un answer this question, really, it's, uh, we have to go inside ourselves to answer this. And this is where our own soul searching comes in. How is it that we actually want to live in cities? Most people don't think about this on an active daily basis. I mean, we're so busy going around working and trying to make money that all of these bigger issues slip by us. We don't, we don't really think about them enough. And we try to point the blame at other people. Who is to blame for all this? Is it the government? They have a lot of things to do. They're behind the times. Uh, they're trying to catch up. And I don't think it is the government's problem. It's not the fault of developers. They're out to make a buck, just like everybody else. It's not the fault of architects and engineers. They try hard often to understand these issues and push them through. But because of budget constraints and because of timing and all kinds of other issues, very few ideas actually end up making it to the table. The fault is actually our own, is people. We don't think about this enough. And there's no voice coming from the people that can actually help buildings be what they need to be. So what we need to actually do is really change the supply-demand equation. If people and developers and investors and governments hear more from us in terms of how we want to live once we've actually thought about that, 
then there's a chance that that information will flow upstream and the buildings that are built will be better than they currently are. And one way to do this, and there aren't many, I've been struggling for years to find the right solution for this, but recently one thing that came to me uh, was something that was put forward by an ev evolutionary anthropologist called Robin Dunbar. You can look him up, his work is really very much worth uh, watching and reading. His idea is that the world uh, that we see it is in fact not working correctly simply because we're not looking at it from the right perspective. Our human brains are in fact capable of only having meaningful relationships with maximum 150 people on average. And that's a really important thing for us to understand in a world where we're trying to build buildings that are for thousands of people and when we live in cities that are actually made for millions of people at a time. If the point of reference is actually 150, if this is our truly uh, the sweet spot of you know, what we should be aiming for, we should also question our lives in social media. Do we really need a thousand Facebook friends? Is it worth it? And I think that more and more people are starting to sense that no, in fact it's not. And the reason for this is in fact because our brains are not built to actually stand more connections than that. We can only manage 150 with the size of the neocortex of our brain. And it's not that we're stupid, it's just that we can't do anything more than that. Once you actually have groups that are within the kind of realm of 150, and it's no coincidence that it, you know, the size, average size of a congregation in a church or a mosque is run, roughly 150. Even in very large companies, departments never generally exceed 150 people. The size of a military company is 150. Why? Simply because those are numbers that are easy to manage, actually. You can use soft social controls. You can think of a grandmother at the head of a large family with just her facial expression that she can control the, the entire group. What actually happens when we move beyond that is that we need rules, we need formal rules, we need police, we need government to be more active, to be more formalized about the whole thing. And this is what we're seeing today, and it's making us all miserable. So what I propose is that at a time where we were thinking about social media and when we're moving so quickly in that, in that realm, in technology, that we actually pull back and use some of those same lessons of this 150 in the way that we actually design buildings to bring it down to a scale, again, that is a human scale, that is not a scale that is beyond something that we can actually understand. So the challenge for all of us, I believe, is to create our own 150. And 150 is actually a maximum. The core group of these, of the people in your life that are really, really very meaningful for you, for you uh, generally is not more than five or six. Uh, the average tends to be around 50 people, and the maximum then tends to be around 150. But if you can think of your core group and actually bring these people around you, what are their passions, what do they love, why do you love spending time with them, are there any things that you can actually create together with them as your friends that takes them to another level beyond friendship, uh, that's what we're concerned about. And we've launched actually a, a concept in this direction called Joint Idea, which actually celebrates the potential synergy, synergies between people. And we're opening up our first uh, physical space, which will bring together venture capitalists, lawyers, uh, photo photographers, fashion designers, developers, architects, engineers, uh, with the intent of actually creating something together that we couldn't do by ourselves and we couldn't do within the groups that we work with uh, on, a, on a regular basis. And I hope that this way of thinking actually starts to spread everywhere because if we, if we can think at the right scale, and the scale in this case being something around 150, we don't need to think in thousands or millions, we can actually really have a positive impact in everything that we do. Thank you.